Well, <clears throat> greetings everybody and welcome to yet another sparkling edition of the show we call the In-World Review. This is a show where we uh, bring you news and discussion on the um, happenings and events and uh, progress and stuff in the um, uh, metaverse, as we call it. The metaverse being um, online spaces, creative community spaces that uh, you can go to and participate online, often in the form of avatars, usually in the form of avatars and that. And we also bring you a bit of information about um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, the, the highlights, really, of uh, current developments in 3D technology, which are um, the sort of things that will probably enhance the um, virtual world and metaverse experience no end when they um, actually finally get their footing. It's a lot of stuff around already, but none of it is yet quite a, what we call a complete solution. So, so bits and pieces for <laughs> different things for different folks. Different strokes for different folks. That is a phrase, is it not? Anyway, uh, today is the... Uh, uh, yes, six or the fifth. He's going to check. <laughs> yeah, it's actually the fifth of September, so it's the first Saturday of a brand new month. And uh, as a result, uh, this week's show is coming as we do every first Saturday of the month from the uh, grand old platform you've probably heard of, of course, Second Life. Yes, Second Life is the high street of the metaverse, full of lots of people who buy things <laughs> and various other things go on here too um but um it's only the the, the original um metaverse linda labs of course who run um second life are busy promoting them a new platform that they're working on at the moment called project sensor not the final name i hasten to add and that is now open to uh, alpha testers although i must say the alpha testers have to be pretty well qualified you have to author your content in Maya, and you also obviously have to be approved by the lab, uh, well, because they want to um, <clears throat> develop a platform full of content before anybody else gets to see it, basically, and they want it a certain quality and and style. We may talk about Project Sansar during the program. I am not sure, as yet. But um, first of all, I'm going to introduce you uh, to everybody who's here. Um, uh, my first credit is going to go to James Atcloud, who is on our camera. Um, it's very easy for me to lodge into all the other people and then forget to credit him because he's not sitting in a seat <laughs> with us. Uh, but he's working behind the scenes, uh, streaming this live on live stream and um, making the recording that will be published tomorrow um, up at YouTube. So thank you to James for all that. Now, um, in the studio here... <clears throat> Um, I'm just going to introduce um, who's here, so because no doubt we'll all be butting in as the conversation progresses. <clears throat> Sadly, um, despite the fact that we're in, um, oh dear, I seem to have had a Facebook Messenger web page launch all of its own accord. <laughs> Hogging my system, sorry about that. I hate Facebook, really. <laughs> uh, right. <clears throat> Um, we um, we would um, normally have hoped to have had Honor McMillan with us, um, but unfortunately, every time she's tried to get hold of me in, um, on Skype to message me today, Skype has been crashing on her, and um, she uh, for a couple of hours she hasn't been showing online at all. So, not quite sure what's up there. But obviously, since she can't get on Skype or in World, then she can't be here. So, um, our wonderful um, another day in our destination um, strand is really suffering these days. But um, I'm sure we'll, she'll be back with us um, in the near future. But uh, you know, it's next time we're here in Second Life. Um, I am pleased to say, however, that um, oh, we've got some regulars here. Um, to my left, um, we have my regular co-host um, every week. Um, that's uh, Maria Koloff from uh, Hypergrid Business. Hi, well, Mel. Always a pleasure to be here. And and my authentic original co-host is also with us because, of course, it is the Second Life Show. So uh, Tara Yates is with us. Welcome, Tara. Thank you, Mel. Good to be here. And also joining us, um, I'm very grateful. He's actually decided to pop in at the very last minute. He's always good for chat, I assure you. And um, it's none other than Felon Carmel from uh, Virtual World's Best Practices, Rockcliffe University, and um, uh, all over the place. Uh, so welcome, Felon. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for having me on. 
And uh, I warn you in advance, if you hear me talking about somebody called Kevin, that is also a felon. <laughs> I do tend to get mixed up sometimes. So, um, right, um, let's get going. I'm just going to start very quickly with uh, the highlights from my Twitter feed, which you can find at twitter.com slash Malburns, or one word. Um, uh, not um, a, a great deal this week, so I'll just um, get those things out of the way. Then we'll move on to uh, Maria's um, headlines, and then we'll move move um, uh, um, over to Tara for more specific Second Life stuff and um, and Kevin, of course. And um, if um, all the guys here, basically, if you want to butt in while we, um, when a topic comes up, then just feel free um, to engage in conversation. We like that free and easy, open-ended style here. Um, right. Um, so, as I say, my Twitter feed. Um, I posted... Some photos on Google, which have ended up on Facebook too, although I don't recall the sending them to Facebook, which is rather odd. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, but basically, I published some nice pictures up at Google Plus of um, the, the scenes from the regions I've been building in Meta World Broadcasting, Meta World Spaces, Melbourne's Estate, and Melbourne's Outland, all four regions <coughs> sort of connected together. And I thought, everybody's post photos. So I thought, well, why don't I post some photos for a change? So, to change from video. Right, roadtovr.com um, announced that 3D mapped HGC Live, uh, HGC Vive demo is bringing archaeology to life. Um, those of you who listen to the show quite often notice that my eyes sort of light up or endeavor to light up whenever we come to anything to do with archaeology and recreations of historical things. So um, um, one project there, again, that's on the virtuality front. Um, Rob Lem VR, I retweeted, they had a post uh, saying, what ha um, this is actually from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I do believe. Uh, what happens when you mix virtual reality with the real world? Indeed, what does? <laughs> well, it looks like an avatar to me, but it's split in half, so I think the other is meant to be the real world. Never mind. Um, what else have we got? Um, I retweeted a post from uh, Fleet 2, uh, otherwise known as Chris M. Collins, um, how a 150-year-old construction company is now using uh, virtual reality. And um, this was an article in um, a magazine called Fortune, uh, fortune.com, uh, quite a well-known mainstream magazine there. Um, also, virtual reality is opening new possibilities for residents in aged care. Uh, this came via Technology Review. Um, if you want the, to look up these articles, by the way, you'll uh, just go to that Twitter feed I mentioned and you'll have a direct link in the, in the post. Um, <coughs> 2015 people. Um, I posted this via Flip. Flip it. I'm not quite sure where it came from, but housebound does not mean being home alone. Voluntarily housebound in virtual worlds. This was a um, obviously, basically, um, it, it's not necessarily about disabilities or anything like that. It's just about um, if you are homebound for one reason or another, um, then you maybe aren't homebound because you have virtual worlds. Um, also, real versus virtual prejudice comes down to choice in a second life. Um, I posted this, it's a second life thing, but I posted it on my main feed basically because um, uh, the, the, the writer hosted a chat session on that very theme and I think the issues it address uh, are relevant to all virtual worlds not just Second Life um, Have you heard Virtuality Becomes a Reality by Innovation Hub on SoundCloud I think oh yes this was actually an audio um, you basically follow the link, it takes you to SoundCloud, and um, it's um, a, a, a podcast saying virtual reality becomes reality. Um, quite an interesting one. Um, various YouTubes. Uh, how to market with Google. Oh, no, that's um, that's Maria's. I'll leave that to her. Can't, can't go one-upping her, can I, with her own feed? <laughs> uh, K&L's beautiful, um, inverted commas here, GE Neuro, lets you explore a DJ's brain, and it's available to download now. This is a post at roadtovr.com. And um, it looks rather visually attractive, but I just thought it's um, a, a rather fascinating idea that you can go into vir virtuality and uh, uh, be listening to music and 
well, explore a DJ's brain. It sounds a bit spooky in some ways, but it also it looked intriguing and rather interesting. And um, talking of apps and stuff, RoadToVR.com also um, announced that um, Pantomime, um, uh, which is a company, I believe, have a, um, a, an app called Playground, which is available on the iPad, iOS. And, um, well, it lets you reach into virtual worlds with an iPad. I have not been able to get the link to download it to satisfactory launch on my iPad. Um, so I can't actually report on what that is like and what it's up to. But um, <coughs> having virtuality of uh, any decent sort on the iPad um, is quite a cool thing. And um, I did see another post. I don't think it's in my list the other day, but it was, um, it was a photograph of, um, I think it was more of a game. Um, to do with bikers and things um, on on the iPad, but I just looked, took one look at the graphics on it and thought, well, if you can get that on the iPad, then we're there. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I I think it's a biker game of some sort where you go on a bike and have adventures, hang out with bikers and uh, multiplayer, um, but um, involving doing quests on bikes more than anything else. But the graphics superb. A very, it felt like Second Life with an added touch of realism. Um, five trending markets that are capitalizing on virtual reality. Um, again, um, this is a link, it's a flipper. Uh, the um, guest author, Constantine Andreev, um, was the author of that article. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, actually Maria may know about this when it comes to her thing. It's um, uh, marketing kind of stuff. Um, right, um, plenty for my good business, which I will um, prompt Maria with if she misses anything later, but I'll leave the rest of that to her. Uh, finally, I wrote to vr.com uh, yesterday um, OS VR. Uh, this is um, open source VR. <laughs> Um, where there's um, a group of basically collaborators working on open source uh, protocols for virtuality as opposed to the non-open source uh, things that various uh, the mega companies have bought up. Um, apparently, NVIDIA, um, Games Work VR, um, has um, joined in with the OS uh, VR group. And the group as a whole have added 65 new industry collaborators. So it's um, quite an goodly number of um, uh, collaborators to be working on virtuality from the open source uh, point of view. And um, I think that's it. Um, oh, there's one more at the top. Oh, no, that's me announcing that the show was going live 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Um, so um, um, uh, you're probably used to me uh, handing over to Tara from here rather than Maria. But I'm, what I'm actually going to do this week is I'm going to um, ask Maria to bring the headlines from Hypergrid Business. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll in interrupt if there's anything to talk about and then we'll um we'll move to tara because we've got quite a lot of show and tell this week and various things happening in linden labs so we'll sort of switch our focus and the hypergrid to second life um a little bit after maria so over to you maria all right so let's turn off my uh, let's turn on my mic and and start talking so um uh I have had an exciting week this week with a couple of things that are not um, in in uh, uh, online yet, but will be. Uh, so I'm going to talk about those last. Uh, so uh, first, let's go through uh, the news. We have had uh, some bad news uh, this week in OpenSim. Another core developer has left uh, the platform. Oh. This is Dahlia Trimble. She oh. was the 15th most kind of productive by the number of code commits in the history of OpenSim. She's been there from the start of the project uh, back uh, in 2008, the summer of 2008. Um, she worked on things like Mesh. She helped bring Mesh to OpenSim in 2010. Uh, most recently, she won the Bounty for um, the LL look at code, which I, I don't know if you guys remember this, but early this year, um, there, were, there was a crowdfunding effort to get this code written to allow things to look at other things. 
And uh, with the, the fix, we can now have things like birds following uh, avatars around. Mm. And uh, Ferd, uh, Ferd Fredrickson um, was uh, kind of spearheading that and got that going. Uh, so, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and most recently, she added the OS get gender function uh, to OpenSim to look up the gender of an avatar uh, yeah. this summer. Yeah. Um, most of the work that she did, she did way back in the early days uh, because that's when most of the work had to be done. Uh, several people have been saying, oh, look, OpenSim development is scaling down. Oh, no, the project is dying. No, every single project out there, every open source project, if you look at the chart of development, up front, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So there's a huge amount of work because it's all being built from scratch. And then as time goes on, you, you're adding new features or fixing bugs, but that's a lot less smaller volume of work. So um, just because the, there's, a, there's a curve that's tapering down, that's just how every software project works. If every software project kept growing at the same pace that it grew its first year, all software out there would be uh, basically Microsoft Windows. You know, huge and unusable. <laughs> and you know, it would take up way too, way too much space in every computer and have too many bugs. Okay, so, um, so uh, uh, on a similar note, the Overt Foundation is also shutting officially shutting down. It might exist unofficially, but this was um, the nonprofit that Justin Clark Casey was the president of, um, and uh, they decided that they don't need it anymore. It was created to handle licensing issues, um, and uh, that's um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why uh, they decided that licensing issues have uh, have. It, uh, don't have a need for them anymore, uh, but apparently it takes a lot of money to keep a nonprofit going and registered, and it wasn't worth um, wasn't worth the effort to keep it going. So, um, uh, so that's um, that's also kind of sad. Uh, and uh, another sad news: a bright canopy has been down all last week, and and you've talked. Uh, we're just talking about bright ca bright canopy, right? Or was that before we we started? taping my mind it's just it's just gone it's the heat <laughs> it, it, it was actually before we came on air basically they um it's a streaming service uh, yes the second life and yes. open sim indeed and uh in fact they've been so successful they basically got swamped and uh they yes. had to go offline well they scale but then yep. it'd be about monday i believe yes well have. actually it's, it's not quite that simple um i i don't have i haven't read all the details but um, apparently they were getting the, the, the costs they were paying to cover server costs, um, is a third party situation. And there was some severe instability in that price in an upward direction <laughs> from where it had been during their early beta, mm -hmm. which, and, and they thought, and, and also they were discovering when they went, when they opened up that they were getting. Um, different usage rates than they had been experiencing in their beta phase. And so the, the, to cut to the chase, um, after a couple of days, they realized that not only were they, were they losing money uh, as far just covering basic expenses, but it, it, it was not going to be sustainable. Um, and so rather than, rather than continue to, <laughs> <laughs> to to drain money, they said, "Wait a minute, we bet we better, you know, we need to regroup here." Um, since then, apparently, the 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 fluctuations in price have stabilized some, except for whatever servers they're using in Ireland, which apparently are still entirely through the roof on price. Um, so they they're still they're still working things out. Um, from reading just kind of the beginning summary of this morning's the meeting they had today to talk about it. Um, it sounds like they're going to go back online on a limited basis. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, not everybody wants in is going to get in. Uh, but but what they, they clearly want to reassure people is this is not – the only people that have been making any money on this thus far is Amazon. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
we 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 <laughs> should point cloud service. Yeah, we um, should point Amazon out. Doing all the work, should, so. Right, we should point out to viewers who are slightly confused as to what we're talking about. Bright Canopy is a method by which virtual worlds, particularly Second Life, but also OpenSea, can be uh, streamed to you in the start of video, and you can get them on. Uh, you know, um, really old computers that don't have the graphics capability for full clients, and the, indeed on iPads and things like that. Basically, uh, you are connected to the world um, using, uh, you know, a, um, an individual instance of a viewer that's housed on uh, Amazon's cloud servers. And uh, Bright Canopy is basically the the core um, coordinator of this. And um, obviously, they are subject to uh, the prices um, charged by the likes of Amazon and stuff like that. But um, uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin, while I've got you here, have, uh, have you had any experience with um, Bright Canopy or indeed the, its predecessor on live? Uh, no, not yet. Mm. Yes. It's um yeah, I, I very it's, simple answer. <laughs> well, it, well, it's one of those ideal things. Um, I've never really tried it. So I did try the um uh, the the online one. Um, uh, mm -hmm. was, um on trial. Um, you know, you can obviously travel around on a bus or a train or something like that with just an iPad, and you you know, for a price, you know, over and above what you may spend on Second Life anyway, you can subscribe to um, so many hours um, of streaming. And it does allow you to get into the virtual world and do everything you would normally do there um, while you're on the move and traveling around. And um, I actually okay. asked you, um, Fallon, simply because um, that might, it might be in some instances, I can see that being of great use to educators where they want okay. a, a really live well, system. Anyway, yes, back to you, Maria. There okay. it is. <laughs> I, I have been using it over the summer. I was in the beta test. It is a fantastic uh, platform. They really have great graphics and um, uh, they can upload, download documents. They've got voice support, the whole shebang. I mean, it's really good. And they, it works with both uh, Second Life Viewer and the Firestorm Viewer. It does not have tablet support. Sorry about that. But it will run on Chromebooks and other low end machines. Uh, they will plan, they plan to have tablet support later on. Uh, but uh, they didn't have it launch. So, so what happened was that um, they charge a flat rate. Well, when they launched, the idea was you pay seventeen dollars for unlimited use the whole month, and and they and they in turn would rent, uh, would pay for computer space by the hour, uh, from eventually from Amazon via uh, another company that kind of organized things in the middle called frame. So Amazon's prices went from uh, 12 cents to 80 cents to a dollar to eight dollars and back down now from 12 cents to eight dollars is a giant fluctuation. It's huge. When you, when you have a business model that's that's basically comes out to seventeen dollars a month for unlimited use. Uh, at 12 cents an hour, you know, you can calculate how much will an average person use and make that work. At $8 an hour, if if they're online for like it's like two hours, that's it. You know, you're mm. you're in in the red, and then after that, you're spending money for every user who's online. Well, so obviously, we know where all the old executives from Linden Lab went to. <laughs> mm. yeah. So <laughs> so they they got. So much, so many people signing up on the first day. They they did they just launched a week ago. That it basically it was impossible for them to have. I mean, they went through all their money. They're not paying themselves any salaries. They're just trying to cover the Amazon hosting costs, and it just it was it was nuts. So so before they wound up millions of dollars in debt, uh, they they hit the pause button and went back to the drawing board to figure this out. So, so they had some uh, technical issues too with scalability because of the growth. They ha they took care of those all those things they took care of right away. Now they're just starting to to figure out how to deal with uh, with the huge fluctuations of prices, and not only day to day the prices are changing, but the prices are also different depending on where on Amazon you have your uh, your your programs running. 
the prices are different on the West Coast, on the East Coast, and in Europe, oh, okay. which is just yeah. also insane. And they're different in different ways. So for European users, you want you want to be running your your servers close to you as possible to reduce lag, and it's just it's just crazy. So um, okay. so the earliest the earliest they're going to be going up is Monday. And they probably will be opening up for only a limited number of users, not for everybody who wants it, because if all of Second Life's million users signed up, it would just destroy these guys. It's a small startup, mm. um, and, uh, and 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 so they're they're trying to get this this under control. Now, over time, long term, the cloud prices are dropping. Uh, and they've been dropping consistently because there's a lot of competition in the space. Amazon's the big player, but Google's trying to get in. Microsoft's trying to get in, and they're all trying to compete based on price. So Amazon has to stay stay on top of that, and Amazon and everyone else been lowering prices. But sometimes when there's a lot of demand, the the it's like it's like fuel, like gasoline at the pump. Mm-hmm. You know, it will just drive the prices up. So. Um, Okay, well, I guess for, yeah. let's move on for now. I mean, I guess we wish them luck and um, hope they, um, you know, get some a, a decent regular price out of somebody, basically. Yes. Um, now, yeah. now there. If you really want to want to do this, um, if you really really want to have open sim, sim in a browser, um, there's also services like Frame, like um, other companies that would let you run any of your software on the Amazon cloud by setting up a virtual desktop. It's like a little virtual computer and you pay by the hour, whatever the rate they have for you. And anything you run on your desktop that you have a license for like Microsoft Office or anything else, you can run in a virtual machine in the cloud. This is usually very pricey um, and you have to install the software. And uh, so it requires a little bit of skill to set it up. Um, but that is an option for people who want to do it the do it yourself route. Um, you might not be able to do you know have have as easy a time of it as uh, Bright Canopy did. They had a super, super nice, super <laughs> easy interface. Uh, I was really astounded by how easy they made it to log into Second Life and Open Sim. They did a really great job. And I, I really I do wish them all the best, um, and, I, and I hope that they're able to get things going. Yeah. Okay, so back to um, the rest of the news um, this uh, past week. So um, the, the, we talked about uh, the Virvox uh, OMC issues uh, when we left off last week. Um, so you mentioned uh, Google Cardboard Marketing. This uh, this has been a major growth area. Frito Lay's, the potato chip company, was giving away free Google Cardboards this week. So if you if you signed up for their virtual kitchen app, you could uh, have received a new um, a, a new Google Cardboard. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Birchbox, which is, I guess, a mail order company that sends a monthly care package with personal grooming supplies to men, included Google Car- Google Cardboard headsets in their in, in one of their packages, uh, which which is pretty funny. Um, well, and- when you consider the cost of it, you know, and, uh, people give away like USB sticks with things on them and stuff like that. I mean, they're giving away a piece of cardboard is so cheap by comparison, you know, so yep. corporate gift, you know. Yep. And an app to go with it, no doubt. Yeah. Yes. So uh, at the Comic Con alone, they gave away more than 103,000 Google Cardboards to people. Um, and earlier this year, Google announced that over a million of them had been sold. So this is uh, this is a, a, a pretty decent marketing platform. Like nobody has Google. I mean, nobody has Oculus Rifts yet. Mm. Um, very few people have the Samsung Gear because they're 200 bucks each. With the Google Cardboard, you can get it for like five bucks or less. Uh, if you buy it in bulk, you can get them for a dollar each or less. And the nicer plastic ones. You can have it for like ten bucks and up, and um, some of them, some of the plastic ones are really nice. I'm going to be talking about 
uh, the latest one that I just got um, a little bit later on after I finish up the news. Okay, so yeah. um, uh, uh, speaking of marketing, uh, the real real time uh, released um, their app for videos, and they had a country music documentary in virtual reality in there uh, f to promote this. Uh, Megs McLean, who's a, a country singer, uh, she was somehow affiliated. Oh, it was given away at uh, the Taylor Swift concert. They gave away. Uh, no. free uh, Google Cardboards. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 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 this is, I, I've got a feeling that Google Cardboards are going to be like um AOL installation disks. Yes, you're going to have you're going to yes. end up with loads of them like around the house. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, one of my one of my freelance writers did a review of 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 seven fun games for the Oculus Rift. Um. And a couple of these are also available for the cardboard, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, so you can so you can check those out if you have an Oculus Rift, or if, like me, <laughs> you have been able to figure out how to use a Google Cardboard instead of an Oculus Rift, because I have successfully been able to do that and logged into OpenSim with uh, my cardboard instead of an Oculus Rift with a control viewer. And I talked about that a couple of weeks back. Yeah. But I'm still proud great, of myself. Great I'm stuff. still very proud great of stuff. Myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still on a high from being able to do that. Uh, a te technical achievement of the week. There's the, the world's first full length virtual reality movie has begun filming in Balti Baltimore. It's about the Russian mafia. It's a comedy crime drama called Career Opportunities in Organized Crime. It's filmed both in traditional video and in virtual VR 360 video. A and it has a bunch of people working on it who I've never heard of. But now everyone's heard of them because it's the first movie filmed in VR. So, uh, and everybody's been writing about it because it's, oh, it's the first movie filmed in VR. How exciting. So. I imagine there's a lot of people in, you know, I love when I've watched a DVD or Blu-ray or something, um, you get to the extras and, you know, if it's a special effects movie, they've always got something where all the, uh, you know, the graphic artists and stuff are talking. And there seem to be, you know, it's a bit, you know, the, there are thousands of people working in that profession. And I can just envisage, you know, whole studios there setting up departments, you know, with these special effects guys who are just move straight, moving straight into the idea of 360. Um, um, you know, there's, uh, there, seems to be a, there, there seems to be a lot of expertise out there, which is probably tooling itself up for the next generation. Oh, yeah. So uh, OSVR is releasing their new development kit next month. Uh, this is the, they're backed by Razer and NVIDIA and a whole bunch of other people. It's an mm. open source alternative to the Oculus Rift. Uh, so, um, and they work with Steam and a bunch of other platforms. Uh, so if you like the Oculus Swift, but you want something more open source, this is a peripheral that plugs into your PC. This is not a smartphone headset. So a different category of virtual reality, higher price category. Um, uh, but that's um, that's interesting. If you are a developer looking at supporting multiple platforms, you might want to get that for yourself. Um, and uh, uh, the other um, uh, the other thing that Valve is involved in is with the HTC's Vive headset, and that's been delayed. They, they were planning to beat the Oculus to market with a Christmas release. And it looks like they're only going to ship out a few early preview versions and the full consumer release will be coming out next year, which is when the Oculus is coming out and everyone else is coming out, the Morpheus is coming out. So next year looks like it's going to be the year of the big console or PC peripheral, you know, the expensive gaming high-end headset. Uh, releases for for the first generation of consumer products. Um, meanwhile, uh, uh, an, another uh, movie news: the United Nations and Vice News and Vrace V R S E have teamed up on an Ebola documentary 
which you can watch either in regular video or in 360 video or in immersive virtual reality if you have the Google Cardboard set. Uh, so kind of a, a sadder um, uh, story, obviously, um, but probably very powerful to watch when you're immersed into the middle of it. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to see we're seeing a lot of immersive journalism coming along that puts you mm. right to the middle of things. We had a Syria documentary coming out, uh, then we had the the Cebola documentary. Uh, it seems to, to be um, kind of trending that this is the way that things are going because it has such a powerful emotional impact. Mm. Um, I, I want to just uh, on, before going on to the next big story. Um, I was trying out new apps like I am wanted to do with my new headset, which, which which I received. And there was one app that was in there that was just photographs. It was a photo, a 360 photograph just standing in the middle of, and they had a little soundtrack like the birds or the crowd noises or whatever that they mm. that they were looping through. And when I was in there, it felt like um, I had a, this is a really good headset. It, I felt like I was in a, a frozen moment in time. <laughs> you, know, you know how in the movies, like yeah. people are always pausing time and everyone's standing still around them, right? Yeah. That is how it felt. It was so freaky. Uh, I just think it's sort of compelling. I mean, by life, uh, I mean, I uh, don't want to blow my own trumpet here, but while I've been. Uh, building downstairs here you know i've got instead of npcs i've got still figures and things and i see everything as a potential camera scene a bit like a painting that's frozen in yeah. time you know and with the, the, the right sounds and ambience you know it's like just having uh, um, environmental effects and looking at the painting right. and you know you can't do everything in virtual worlds where every single thing moves and everything so right. it's uh, i i can really appreciate that you know it's like the way you you're watching landscape documents documentaries with music on and things yeah. you just you know it's an enhancement and sometimes the simplicity is the thing that makes it so good yeah so i've been going through my old uh, pictures of kids and scanning them in and each time i was like oh this is so sad They're, they were so tiny and i'm never gonna <laughs> see that again but 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 going into in, in the, the virtual reality into these photographs that were stored there it, it felt like you were actually there, not looking at a picture on a screen or a picture on a, in a photo album, but that you were actually back in that moment because you're standing in the middle of this crowd of people looking around and it's photorealistic because it's a photograph. It's mm. an actual photograph. And it really does feel like time has frozen and you've stepped back into this little moment in time. And I would have killed to have had one of these cameras to shoot my kid i mean to film my kids with mm -hmm. uh I, yeah i felt like shooting them plenty of times but uh <laughs> and, to be, and then to be able to go to, to step into that yeah I and to me. be yeah. back there with them i think that is such a great killer app i'm i'm really looking for i'm doing some reviews of 360 cameras later on this yeah. week and because there's a lot of them hitting the market now, they still cost a few hundred bucks each at the lowest end. So this is not something that every consumer is going to run out and get. And stitching together 360 pictures um, with, with like a regular cell phone camera is possible but tricky. And I'm going to try some of those apps out as well. Uh, but you know, you know it's going to get easier. You know it's going to get cheaper. We're all going to get 360 cameras in our cell phones really soon. And it's going to be... I'm really, re as somebody with kids that I photograph and hopefully with grandkids someday that mm -hmm. I'm going to be taking pictures of. It sounds I, like I this. really want this. I really, really want this. It sounds like this is a new category. You know, we've got immersive worlds. We've got immersive cinema. Why not immersive photography as a standalone art form? I can, I can imagine. Absolutely. You know, photography being moving into in this direction because it's it's simply about capturing moments as opposed to uh, storytelling, yeah. and, and, and seems uh, ideal. Or, or like the Vine style short loops, like short snippets of videos, like the kids blowing out their birthday candles, you know, mm. or falling off of the chairs. Well, whatever it is that you're, the short little things where you're not watching it or having to edit the whole movie, you're just filming little snippets, which is very easy for a general person to do without mm. 
technical editing skills, just, you know, shoot a little, little snippet. I would love that. I would love that so much. And, and I recommend that anybody who hasn't had a chance to experience this, um, check it out. Uh, the Google Cardboards are really super cheap. Um, and uh, the, the, the app, the specific app that I was looking at uh, was called, um, I've forgotten what it is already. I, I, I'll post something up about it uh, later on. Um, but it, Orbulus, that, that was it, Orbulus, um, where people upload their 360 photos with a little bit of sound there. Um, really, really nice. I really recommend it. Very powerful movie experience. Okay, so uh, uh, my last story, DigiWorlds has a new viewer. It's based on Alchemy. Uh, Alchemy uh, the Alchemy viewer just uh, announced support for OpenSim last month. Cinder Roxley is the lead developer, formerly of Firestorm. Uh, they, really, uh, they, they really came out strong in favor of OpenSim and OpenSim development. And uh, D- DigiWorlds brought them in to create a custom viewer. And they've added Carl's Mesh Deformer to it. Now, uh, four years ago, there was a crowdfunding campaign that raised 5000 uh, bucks for Carl's Mesh Deformer. Since then, InWorlds has added it to their viewer. And now, so this is the second grid that has, has that deformer. But uh, the DigiWorlds viewer can be used to log into other grids. Mm-hmm. Uh, all you have to do is go into Preferences and enable the Grid Manager said Terry Ford, so it's clearly okay with him to do this. Mm. And then you can use it to log into any grid and you have the mesh deformed. <clears throat> it will work in, uh, it will certainly work in the Great Canadian grid because Terry is, um, they're, they're identical back ends basically. Yes. So, uh, well, as is apparently it's fully server side. I mean, sorry, it's, it's zero right. server side, it's fully viewer side. Yeah. So as long as you have the viewer, it doesn't matter what the server is, what grid you're on. If it's in the viewer, you can you can see it and you can use it, but only people with that viewer can see it. So if you mm. have the mesh deformed clothing and you have this viewer, you can see it. If somebody else doesn't have that viewer but has a traditional viewer, they cannot see it. Uh, but Ford said that he hopes to see other uh, viewers pick up the code as well, like Firestorm and Singularity. Mm. Um, and uh, he, he said that he picked Alchemy instead of Firestorm um, because the, the, he had a previous working relationship with, with Cinder Roxley, uh, but also because um, they have a faster inventory loading um, and they had uh, this, uh, and he liked the look, the clean look that they had and other stuff. Now, um, a little mm. bit of a heads up. For anybody considering renting land on DigiWorlds, now um, DigiWorlds is one of the lowest cost grids. They've got a deal where you can get a region for $16 a month for 15,000 prims, and you can scale this region up so it's a four by four sort of island of of 16 regions total. So you still have just the 15,000 prim limit but you have it over 16 regions. So you yeah. can have land and, and sailing and water and whatever you want it is you want to have in there. Uh, they're raising prices on October 1st to pay for their improved hardware, their software and other stuff. So, um, uh, so if you want to get in on their current pricing, you're going to need to rent stuff before the end of the month, before they um, they switch it up. And then the other two things that I wanted to mention that I'm going to be writing up uh, that I haven't written up yet is first, um, I, I finally played a video game on cardboard that was a real virtual reality video game. Now, I, I talk about all these different apps that I try, but most of them are demos. It's like, this could make a cool game someday, right? Mm. Or it's a short little marketing thing, or it's a short little promo, or it's a you know, 360, short 360 video, but not like a <laughs> real consumer polished game. Well, I finally played a game that was polished uh, and consumer. It was really, really a great game. It is called Lamper. It's available for Oh, I've heard, I've heard of this. Yeah. For both uh, iOS and for Android. And the only 
it doesn't require any buttons, doesn't require external controller. So this will work with the oldest, simplest, cheapest cardboard you've got. It doesn't require you to spin around in a chair, you know, wave your arms around or stand up and walk around. So it's a mm. great thing to play in the backseat of a car um, or in an airplane um, or anything else. So it's a Lamper. Lamper, L-A-M-P-E-R, Lamper VR. Yeah. And what it is is you've got, yeah. you got, you got a bug. The bug is flying down a tunnel, very colorful, very cute. And you want the bug to avoid obstacles like giant spiders and big rocks. And you want the bug to pick up candies that, that are along the way. And, and you navigate by turning your head slightly, just slightly, and it's super responsive, super fast, no lag, wonderful use of virtual reality, the scoring, the levels, you level up as you go along, lots of fun, great music, polished commercial very nice game very good okay. yes and well, my final thing before i go <laughs> is is i ordered the fly uh, the free fly headset which is 85 dollars on amazon i ordered it last week it arrived uh two days ago it comes with an external controller i got it at a discount for 60 bucks it is wonderful so light wide wide field of view um works with uh, my samsung galaxy 6 fit in there just fine and there was room for even bigger ones in there uh fantastic lenses great uh, so nice to use i played a whole bunch of games with it it i the video the image quality was just fantastic it really felt like i was there and what's this uh, called again the Free Fly VR. Free Fly VR. Okay. Free Fly, it's, new, yeah. it's just new on me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a brand new one. And the, it's just on the market. And so I expect the prices to keep falling. <laughs> it is really, really nice. Very, very beautiful design. Uh, <laughs> comes with a really nice carrying case. Uh, like I said, it comes with a controller, which is 10, you know, costs 10 bucks if sold separately. So, so I kind of feel like I got a $50 headset. And it's definitely worth 50 bucks. It's very I, nice. I think you've got a, a piece of hardware for every day of the month. <laughs> <laughs> well, but which one you're going to stay? Every day goes by, you've got a new one to you for favor valves. Well, a friend of mine and I are actually <laughs> talking about doing a YouTube video channel where I try out these games and the headsets and talk like a real person about, about them, not like a you know nerd review like we've we, like we, we have some, uh, but like a, a, a real person review of all these things. And I think that'd be fun. That'd be okay. fun. Okay. Okay. Well, I, th I think, I think uh, Maria, much as, as Mal refers to Honor McMillan as another day, another destination, you're going to be soon referred to as another day, another gadget. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, very good, Tara. Right. We 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 got we got to make up some signs to go in front of the chairs <laughs> describing who sat in the chair. Okay, well that's great. We'll come back to more of that in discussion. Um in other technology news, however, um, Apple are doing a big release of stuff, which, of course, is long awaited. Um, um, it, during this week, I believe it is, um, expected is the launch of the iPad Pro with a bigger screen, um, although probably iOS, not a dual operating system. And um, Tuesday. So, yeah. And also, finally, an upgrade, a major upgrade to the Apple TV box, which um, is now going to be controllable with a graphical uh, screen, a bit like an iPod, uh, rather than just the buttons you have with the current Apple TVs. <clears throat> but um, with a serious focus, by the look of it, on um, launching it as um, not only TV channels and stuff, but as a kind of gaming box. And, uh, and one should always keep in mind that anything that you read or hear before the official announcement day by Apple yes. is conjecture. 
and very <laughs> limited leaks of real information. Yeah. So well, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we will know. We will know for sure next week. But I mean, uh, <laughs> when you see reports all over the place, um, which are pretty close to the mark, um, you. <gasps> <laughs> it's clear that they haven't let it lead to too many details, just the general gist of it. Um, so um, that's quite big. The other thing I meant to mention as well, um, here, um, I was about to say here in Great Canada Group, but we're in Second Life. Um, Linda Kelly is also now on the Great Canadian Grid, um, as Linda Kelly interestingly enough. Um, so she's in DigiWorlds, but she's also uh, taken up residence on the Great Canadian Grid and will, as she was telling us in chat, will be bringing stuff over. <laughs> um, uh, although you can always get it on DigiWorlds at the moment anyway. Uh, so good news. She's definitely resurfing. So um, um, uh, um, before we to get any, any further, we've got, of course, Tara's news and show and tell. And, um, but we mustn't forget Kevin sitting at the end there. He's butted in a couple of times, but it's been otherwise very quiet. Um, I've got my um, another um, uh, Twitter feed, which is twitter.com slash Malburns space writer, which um, is really a sort of media chronicle with videos and online magazines that are um, in a virtual world um, stuff. But um, I, uh, I also publish um, a few sort of tweets there, and it's a very long list. So um, before I hand you over to Tara, I'm just going to look at the top of the list <laughs> so that we're basically, so, while she's talking, I can scroll down the rest of it. <laughs> and um, uh, note um, that there are lots of photographic blogs that are showing off places here in Second Life. Um, and um, the links you'll find on that feed. Um, there's a build based on Santa. Santa Maria del Isola in Italy, which looks extremely nice. I'm very jealous. Um, Bear Rose, who are a kind of fashion house, actually, um, have been around for ages. Um, SL Governor Marley reported that um, they're just about to celebrate their 10th birthday. And they're doing it with um, a story-based hunt. So it won't be your average um, fashion um, hunt, you know, um, or the prizes maybe, for all I know. But um, it's basically a whole story-based hunt that they've devised um, to celebrate their 10th anniversary so that will be going on in World in Second Life here um, uh, in in a while um, I just, I saw something odd on camera there sorry um, another, um, another interesting location Cape Juniper uh, J-U-N-I-P-E-R um, reviews of that also Maloi Van Sant uh, which looked very nice that's from Kate Bergdorf's blog um, M-A-L-O-E and then V-A-N-S-A-N-T and Escapades um, which of course is Loki um, Elliot and um, um, I don't think Escapades is a tiny thing it's a, a separate thing but it's a wonderful a wonderful quirky sort of thing um, they're celebrating their fifth anniversary in Second Life and in our pay um, a modern world Emmy had um, a post about that uh, she also had a post on Tranquil Dreams in Second Life and um, there we are. I'm now going into my list of um, thousands and thousands of YouTube and Vimeo entries from uh, the thing. Oh, yes. And another post from yesterday. Ground level. Um, uh, the Sydney School ground level, I believe. And there was a photo spread um, on the gardens. Uh, Friday, of course, Linden's had highlights from their own destination guide, which is usually quite a, a, interesting in its own right. Um, Siki Questi uh, posted about um, the, uh, the BO um, Best of Second Life Art Gallery has an exhibition with Skip uh, Statelli and Reggie Kifu. And, um, oh yes, and um, it, at Issue, there was um, a new magazine I, I, I located on Issue called Spindle and Rye, fashionista kind of glossy magazine. And um, SL Goth magazine had their uh, September issue online. And on Friday, we had the Friday front, <coughs> sorry, Friday hunt report. <coughs> Good photo spread on a venue called the Isle of Grace. Very much a landscape driven simulation there. And uh, Windline magazine in World 
um, have um, their first gallery artist in residence, and that's Wicca Merlin. She's known in the art world, but actually she's probably known better in the fashion world, but she's their first artist in residence. So um, while I further pursue my old tips and what's this from Second Life, I'm going to uh, hand the mic over to Tara, and um, she will bring us uh, the, the, the more fit depth stuff from Second Life. And uh, I know she's got a real handful of show and tell this week. So over to you, Tara. <laughs> Thank you, Mel. <clears throat> greetings, everyone, and uh, greetings from the Pacific Northwest, where it hasn't been quite as warm the last couple of weeks, which has been just lovely <laughs> after us breaking many records in this part of the world for temperatures over the last six months. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, well, first, first things first. Um, at least I, we can we can say that that Mel is uh, <clears throat> in sync with the special day it is today. Today is <clears throat> World Beard Day. Uh, whether whether you prefer a goatee, a Van Dyke, a mutton chops, or chin <laughs> curtain, there are various ways to mark the annual event, which is the first Saturday in September. So, there you have it. So, um, you I, basically, I just have to keep the same look on for a year, and I'm fashionable. No, it? no, it's just it's, it's only celebrated on the first Saturday of September. You can shave tomorrow. Yeah, I know, but what I mean is if I just stay the same for a year, if I get a special day once a year. Very good. Very once a year. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, you know, probably each of us has some, some attribute for which we can we can observe one, at least one day a year that somebody has declared a special day. Uh, <laughs> I always look forward to left-handed day, um, oh, yeah. for example. Anyhow. <laughs> well, yes, indeed. Show and tell. You know, show and tell is, is uh, has become... Um, <laughs> something that, that I am greatly fond of doing uh, because it gives me an excuse to, to, to go wander around and find interesting things. And uh, to, to start off with this week, um, um, I would note a freebie. Um, you too can have your very own fifth birthday Firestorm celebration kitty cat. Um, this is the third year that Kitty Cats has produced a Firestorm birthday kitty um and uh, we have i have a birthday kitten which uh, uh if uh, james zooms in enough on he, you can actually see because she was just born yesterday and her name is sasha and she's joined her, she's joined her her elder siblings uh <clears throat> on the cushion there and uh, by next week in seven days she'll be full-sized but uh um, they've outdone their, themselves in the paint job. This um, paint job, <laughs> the color scheme this year, and, and and the design. She's 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 gorgeous. She's just just very 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 pretty. You know, very cool flames on this on this one. <clears throat> anyway, um, and in the same vicinity over there. Speaking of flames, um, <clears throat> if uh, James, I guess, to zoom out here, you will see something called zebra burning. Yeah. Zebra on fire, yes. And this is one of a couple of items that I picked up at a very interesting gotcha event that 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 um, <clears throat> Mad P did that I only caught up with right at the tag end of it. Um, it ended last weekend, so sorry you're out of luck. But it was a it was a gotcha event of specifically for artists uh, of you know artists stuff. In other words, artists were stuffing gotchas with stuff as distinct from, you know, the, the usual run of things. And so I had to go visit, and uh, the, the, this burning zebra is one of several wacky items that one uh, artistic sort by the name of uh, uh, Garvey Garzo uh, produced. Uh, there's also, uh, um, these were all kind of uh, interesting items in the, in the theme of, a, you know, a creative mind. I have a, uh, a picture frame that's part burnt wood wood out one side that's very interesting and then there's one that's that's a uh, a, a <laughs> burning big mistakes uh which is this bonfire of frames <laughs> i'm sure there were canvases in them at some point but at this point they're looking more like just frames on fire um and there were some other items in that one and then in the back there there's an item uh, another another item from there uh called water lily by uh giovanna cerise um, which looks like, you know, when you first look, you think, oh, it's wireframe. It hasn't resed yet. Uh, but it is wireframe uh, in construction. I'm sure it's, this was done with, uh, with mesh, uh, but it's kind of interesting. And that was another item that I picked up at that, uh, at that gotcha event. I, I hope that this, this becomes um, 
a more frequent kind of occurrence because it's a wonderful way for artists to, uh, you know, to show off their stuff, um, to uh, perhaps make a few dollars that they wouldn't otherwise, um, you know, from from people who might, you know, get a, get a kick out of doing a gotcha event where they might not necessarily go to galleries. Um, mm. So I was, I thought it was a, you know, a very cool idea and uh, um, props to Mad P for coming up with it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> In the in the but in the, in the world of the gotcha events, of course, every three months we have a new arcade gotcha, and and this is the you know this is the the, the grandparent of, of gotcha events, um, and uh, I, I I'm sh- the, I'm sure that the the folks who are who are participating in that with uh, with gotcha items are you know there's almost a competition I think that must go on <laughs> on the back on the uh, you know on the backside for you know for for cool stuff and. They have outdone themselves in the realm of buildings this this time around. They're just, uh, you know, it seems like there are lots and lots of, of the of the collections that that were buildings and the the accessor accessories to, to go with them. And then this and then the second thing that's very big are various kinds of critters. And if you're a dog person, you will love this round of the arcade gotcha. Um, now there are no dogs in what I've collected thus far because I. We've, I've showcased dogs before, but what I do have is a couple of raccoons, um, and the ra- these raccoons are great, um, and, and and particularly fitting given the fact that I had summer visitors of a raccoon mama and her five kids uh, that I got some some real life pictures of, and uh, have had kind of a running battle with anything with water in it around my house in the way of a bucket or a watering can <laughs> of uh, I can't. <laughs> If I put it out, it's tipped over the next morning. If it's a, you know, I put, I because it's been so dry, I've been putting water out for the birds and, and the cats in the daytime. And overnight, uh, those raccoons have been finding that water dish and they they bring whatever to it and they're washing it. And so the, it's just full of dirt when I check it the next morning. So I was delighted to pick the one up that was drinking. Um And of course, raccoons are notorious for getting into. <laughs> now, next to the raccoons, not to let cats egg here, we have. Uh, oh, the raccoons, by the way, are uh, Mutress. These are cheeky red raccoons. There's several others uh, in the uh, gotcha. And it's Eki Clock is the creator. Um, anyway, next to the raccoons, we have. Um, <clears throat> right, I think I think okay. we're back. I I lost it was cracking up a bit, and I lost it too. But I think we're back. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, well I think we all did. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not yeah. I'm not sure when when uh, where where I was talking. You lost. Um, I, I was watch, I was watching uh, James doing a wonderful job panning around while the raccoons with the bucket and um, uh, uh, yeah, so yeah. Then it started warbling a bit, but um, yeah, we got we got that. <laughs> okay, you got the raccoons uh, just before the kitty. Oh, okay. So 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 the kitty the kitty yes that it, uh, you may not have heard the kitty introduction uh, is uh, from Pixie Cat. The creator's name is Areve, uh, and it's a Bastet Sphinx cat. The Sphinx are the the hairless kitties. Um, and then next to the next to the longstanding napping puppy, um, we have a new a new visitor, a squirrel, uh, who's part of an autumn bounty collection from Schadenfreude. Uh, the invent the creator is Allegory Malaprop, uh, and he uh, is moving his head and kind of keeping an eye on this acorn he's got. Um, and that collection is kind of a, an assortment of, of uh, fall-related food s- items with strange visitors, and I happily managed to, to catch the squirrel on the first try. Um, anyway, now, the other thing I have is a couple of items of furniture, and, you know, uh, in, at least in the U.S. of A, uh, some people <laughs> will get old refrigerators and paint them funny or put stickers all over them or decorate them in some sort. So you, there's a, a, a gotcha item where you can get your very own 
decorated refrigerator and you'll see one there. And this particular refrigerator also, if you click on it, will give you, will give you various options of food choices. Um, and I've arranged a few of the, of the options on top, uh, ranging from a Chinese takeout to pizza. And uh, there's a veggie platter for those of you who are so inclined. And, uh, but you can wash it down with some, with some ale. <clears throat> anyway, and then we, we move on to the clock collection. And uh, it seems like uh, grandfather clocks were big this time around, or at least they turned up in two different gotchas. Um, and uh, one of them is uh, the first one with the door open and the book spilling out of it um, is uh, a creation of 8F8, uh, who has done some f just fabulous gotcha collections that have always been around like a building theme. Um, I have a coffee house with all kinds of coffee house goodies that go in it. Um, he did, he's done an ice cream parlor with lots of goodies and the clock is part of, uh, it, the, the entire collection, um, is a storyteller's burrow, which had, and, uh, and of course the rare item is the, is the house, the, the house itself. But, um, this particular grandfather's clock is from that collection. Um, and you'll see it's loaded with books and kind of cropped open. Next to that, the other grandfather clock, which is a functioning grandfather clock, uh, and you can even set it to your own time zone if you want to. Um, it's currently set to second lifetime, and it's reporting second lifetime. It has a pendulum that moves, and it makes noise. I'm not sure I haven't, I haven't listened to it yet, um, but it's got some different things it does depending upon the time of day. Um, anyway, this is, this is from the folks at Contraption. Uh, the place that I've you've seen I've I've uh, had the uh, the train collection. Uh, there's been some fabulous music boxes uh, with moving parts, uh, and the the bottom of this uh, clock also opens, so you can open up the bottom of it too. Anyway, just yeah, wonderful, wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful stuff. What uh, a anyway, I must say. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's quite an, and this is, certainly isn't everything I picked up thus far. But you know, you kind of you pick and choose what to, <laughs> what to show off. One last one last introduction out in front. We have a new bunny, um, and uh, you know, I always think of Pet Love, who's a bunny person, and uh, this is a particularly cute bunny, which you can change colors. And this is this is just a regular purchase from a place called Dysfunctionality. Um, created Kyla Kyla Firelight is the creator. Um, lots of good stuff, and you've seen other items. Uh, you may recall some cows uh, recently, and those are also from dysfunctionality. Uh, but you'll notice that the rabbit's ears wiggle and its nose wiggles, and it'll sit up sometimes, and it's you know it just moves around. It's very cute, and you and it's it's yeah, it's got built in. You can you can have <clears throat> you can res as many as you want of them. You know you, we know how r rabbits reproduce. Um, and they can be whatever colors you want. You've got quite a rainbow of, of options for colors for these little guys. Anyway, um, a few items, uh, just a few news items uh, other, other than my show and tell here. Um, for those who are premium members or are thinking about it, um, they have reduced the monthly rate for uh, premium membership uh, to $9.50 a month. I think the monthly rate was 11 something, was 11.50? Um, I get it annually, which is considerable, considerable savings over that. Um, anyway, um, the, in addition to that, and perhaps of greater importance and noteworthiness to those uh, outside the U.S. and in, the, in, in uh, your part of the world, Mal, and, and other places, is they are no longer charging VAT for premium subscriptions. Uh, we, if you live in a yeah, we mentioned this last week. It's um, it's a racket that actually happens here quite a bit. Actually, they they're not legally allowed to stop charging VAT. What they're actually doing is they're lowering their price so that with VAT added, it's the same price people over there are paying. Um, so in a, in a way, if you're if you're business in the UK, you're getting an even cheaper offer because you can reclaim whatever proportion is that. But they, they, they promote it as not charging you VAT. In fact, they have to charge you VAT. They're just bringing their price down so that the VAT makes it look the same as the American price. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, I'm just you know I'm just quoting the official the official statement there, uh, but I think that's significant because I know there was a lot of there was there was, you know, significant amount of grumbling when when the lab started charging VAT. Yeah, indeed. Uh, having, 
Um, and presumably VAT is still applies on uh, land tier. Uh, anyway, uh, Loki Elliott, um, who has produced any number of fabulous uh, games and adventures and continues to do so, is having uh, an open house sort of weekend this weekend, uh, celebrating on his Escapades Island five years of activities in Second Life. Um, yeah. You can find the full lineup of what's going on as far as events, including a variety of uh, battle balloon things, I think, um, in uh, in our Pays blog. It uh, looks like great fun and uh, lots of things to do, even if you don't want to go participate in the battle. So, you know, go check it out. If you haven't visited, it's well worth it. They're, I, I noticed a video yesterday. I didn't put it in my stream, but um, Justin Dupre obviously tried to do a live stream or something from Escapades Island. And the, the, ca the camera shots were stuttered and there was no audio in it or anything. And they, you know, I'm surprised he put it up because everybody says he's Justin with high quality machine. About it. <laughs> and here was this awful attempt and live streaming um, the Escobar's Island. Uh, you've got, you've, at least you've got the idea. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Well, sometimes things just don't quite work the way you hoped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the Second Life, um, the Second Life uh, blog, a community tab in the official website is now uh, including the Second Life Flickr pool. Uh, pictures, Second Life pictures, pick of the day. So uh, um, if, if you uh, don't care to catch those uh, in uh, Twitter or uh, Facebook, you can now get the official view, and there's some special ways you can view them. Um, and I would refer you again to NR Pay's blog to for a rundown on those. And the last item I, I wanted to mention is apparently um, they are in the process of some organic resurfacing of the Community Gateway program. Ah, yes, yes, that's um, and. Um, it's uh, it's still it's it's still unclear. They haven't decided who all is going to be uh, in it this time around. It it sounds like the Help People Island has um, been may have been already re uh, revived. Um, but uh, anyway, I think that's very good news um, that they're that they've taken that step that they that they've listened um, mm. to to people's comments and you know the the places we know about of of, Lon of virtual London and. Uh, um, I have on I have on my list here in our page blog at uh, Madame World at uh, me about that, and <laughs> um, you know she she rightfully pointed out that um, I, I think this is put to uh, the former CEO Rob Vic Linden when he first joined and he uh, after he first joined you know and he just didn't know what these things were but they're an important part of Second Life's legacy you know um, you know because they they generate the communities and it allowed. Uh, communities to be a focal point for people you know i remember you could sign up at virtual london as you just implying and you know mm -hmm. you could um as as a virtual london resident you had a special choice of usernames for example uh, right. that yeah. were only available for that portal so you know you could become malburn's um um, um, um sideburn <laughs> and that sideburn surname would identify you as being part of london community um that's fiction, of course, but you get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there was also a period of time um, after Linen Lab scuttled last names mm. in the official portal when you could still pick up a last name through one of the community portals. It took a while for that to filter out mm. to el completely eliminate them. Um, you know that that, that there was there were a lot. I, rec I remember there were lots of. Uh, Lots of rumors flying about which portals you could still go register in to pick up a to pick up a last name if you really wanted one. Uh, so anyway, but I'm I'm really glad to see that come back because you know I it 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 I think it it does respond to a lot of special interests. Um, the community portals I think have have consistently done a better job of of um, putting together you know good intro material uh, mm -hmm. and. And having staff around to kind of give new newcomers a, a hand without being into the, you know, some of the issues that crop up in the official uh, <clears throat> areas and the and particularly the the newer welc the older welcome areas that are notorious for um, griefers and idiots <laughs> <laughs> looking for trouble. <laughs> anyway, that's it for me. That's enough. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
looking for you. seeing what Phelan's up to these days. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, um, I've scrolled down Phelan, my... Phelan would know absolutely nothing about the community gateway, nor would we be able to talk about it if we did. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You probably had one once in, once about a time. Did, did, did Rob Cliff have one? We did. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Um, it's like educational discounts and everything else. You tend to be a bit jaded when, you know, in a way, it's nice to see all these old things that they mislaid coming back. On the other hand, well, I, I, I tell you, it's interesting because actually, I want to pick up on this because there, hmm. there are. So yes, absolutely, the lab is having conversations with different groups. Yes, we are trying to worm our way into ingratiating ourselves as Rockcliffe back into that particular program again. However. Um, there's a lot of things that I think they're still trying to work out uh, on their side. Uh, the conversations have been going on for a couple of months now. Um, so it'll it'll be interesting to see what happens once they've um, reviewed the various proposals and what have you. But uh, it, it, it should be interesting. I'm, I'm sort of really encouraged by this because I think to a large extent, there's a lot of things that we sort of lost when... A, you know, a lot of these communities uh, and their gateways and the mentor group, you know, more specifically the mentor groups that were mm. supporting new residents, regardless of whether you had a gateway or not. I mean, when Linden Lab basically came in and said, um, thank you very much, but your services are no longer oh. required. I mean, that was just devastating to everybody. Yeah. I mean, and then that was just the start of a very long string of very silly mistakes. So it's, you know, it, I'm sort of being encouraged because they're slowly, like over the last two years, they've been slowly coming to terms with the fact that there's a lot of things that they had done early on, you know, back in Phillips Day, mm. and they're starting to reintroduce those things back into the environment. So mm. it'll be interesting to see where this goes with Inside Second Life, what potentially it will have in terms of a spillover effect for other grids, like in worlds and, and you know, the whole open sim community. Um, and then the whole uh, Sensar project in terms of mm. what's going to happen there, because that's a, my understanding is that's a very different type of uh, framework that they're going <coughs> to introduce. Now, that, and, <coughs> that's actually quite interesting because I was going to ask you about that. And we have talked about that um, on other shows recently, of course. Um, Oddly enough, uh, Hamlet Orr had a blog, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, one or the other, um, which um, he comes up with some weird stuff, but uh, <laughs> it's often out of date. But he had a post about some research that had shown that um, out of house CEOs brought in to run companies um, um, have an 80% failure rate. Um, um, versus um, in-house, uh, or rather CEOs from within a company. And he was making a point that uh, this was something that Linden Labs maybe were only finally realizing, because as we know, um, Ebe Linden, uh, Ebe Olberg, of course, um, was with Second Life since the beginning. He wasn't Philip, and he wasn't actively involved uh, with the lab in the way the, the Lindens were, but he'd been around since the beginning, and he obviously had a knowledge of um, uh, the platform and um, also to his son to a certain extent, the history um, that, that had gone down. And we have Mark Kingdon as the CEO, then we have Rodvik, um, um, uh, what's this? <laughs> Rodvik, what's this? I've forgotten, <laughs> forgotten his surname above the Linda one. Uh, but anyway, they, um, they weren't people, uh, they had histories of their own that made them seem appropriate maybe, but they came in from outside. Whereas um, Ebe Linden, um, Ebe Altberg, um, is, I think you could say, an insider. He knows the platform. And we, we've seen this renewed um, community interest from him. He'll, he'll go in world. <clears throat> he doesn't often go in as an old. He just goes in himself and descends <clears throat> on, on communities and things. There's a lot of people in Second Life who've never heard of him because they don't care who the CEO of Linden Labs is. But he just trots around and um, he does engage um, with communities. You and I know this, for example, you know, he's been present at the uh, Virtual World's Best Practices uh, for the last two years. Um, so, um, you know, and, um, you know, he talks about engaging with, um, it could be the educational community, but it could be all sorts of other kind of communities. So I think he's onto a good thing there. But what worries me slightly 
is that uh, where um, for people in Second Life, there's news about Project Sansar here, there, and everywhere. But the the alpha testers are actually tend to be people outside Second Life who are experts at working in things like Maya. And the message about Project Sansar is becoming increasingly um, one of a different kind of world fit for a purpose but not necessarily user created um, even though to Second Life they they promote it as the spiritual successor to Second Life it, it increasingly seems that really there won't be opportunities for people to come in and learn how to res a prim and then how to res another different shape prim and then how to manipulate the prims that well, sort of thing has been a, a, a learning curve but quite easy in second life and i don't think that's going to be i'm not pro- quite entirely convinced though because i mean the the one thing and it, it sort of put a lot of things into perspective for me and i don't i don't know whether or not this is true or not i have no basis of this other than the fact that you know in a couple of statements ebby's come out with he's basically said Sansar is supposed to be like the world press of virtual worlds, right? That's the way they're trying to market it. That's the way they're trying to position it. If that, in fact, becomes the case, then it looks like from a technical architecture perspective, it it sounds as if this is going to be something similar to OpenSim in that you you go out, you you pick up the software, and you run it in your own cloud, whether you take it to Amazon or whether you go to you know whoever else right there's all kinds of gaming companies that will host these types of things mm. and you know and to be quite honest i mean philip's going this particular route as well well right? yes definitely yeah it's high fidelity right they're doing they're doing pretty much exactly the same thing so i think one of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to get out of this space to a certain extent of saying we need to manage the server in- infrastructure in order to make this happen um, rather, they want to focus on the software and the software development, which means bringing in all these Maya people actually makes far more sense as a first step. Mm. Because if you want to introduce something like a, you know, WordPress type, you know, virtual environment, you can't do that unless you've got people that have already got a, um, you know, a collection of content. Mm. And a collection of plugins that are all ready to go when you go to launch this. Yeah, it's so, like a, it's like a template for the world. Yeah. Yeah. Pre- yeah. Pretty much. So, so it's going to be a little bit interesting to see what happens. Now, there's all kinds of questions that I would have in terms of where this potentially is going. But from an initial architecture perspective, I can already sort of picture in my head how it how it potentially might work. Um, having said that, we already know that there's all kinds of other problems. So, for example, all those people in, in OpenSim that tried to incorporate Vivox and then Vivox basically, you know, ran them over with a Mack truck. You know, it, you've got those particular types of things that are going to come up and are going to get in the way of being able to have those particular types of successes, right, in, in mm. terms of trying to do what I think it is that they're they're going to eventually release. But until... They get past the alpha, and until until they're ready to bring uh, groups in, like you know our group and other groups, hopefully into the beta portion of it, because uh, we've been really pushing on trying to get involved in the beta piece of this. Mm. Um, you know, I I think you know there's too many variables, there's too many unknowns, but it it looks as great right at the moment. So I I don't know I'm not I'm not completely convinced that this whole thing where we're saying well you know you're going to be you're going to have to give up the ability to build with inside a virtual world right. I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case I think we're going to have the ability to do that Yeah I'm not sure that that was that itself was going to be the case but I did get the impression that the the discipline required and the ability to build um, and contribute to the world will be um, of um, a higher learning curve and requires some, um, you know, great greater expertise. I mean, I, uh, you know, the the, the way they the, the way they appear to be getting the mayor builders in and things like that is, uh, as I say, it's like a template, and they they want the thing to look good and slick. Um, and I, unlike Second Life, I get the impression that this will be a platform where co- quality control 
um, be it becomes uh, an imperative. You know, I, I doubt if there'll be quite the sort of anarchy that we sometimes see, see it um, created. If I can jump in on that one, yeah, that you know there. There was there was a rumor flying around that there you know that there was going to be some kind of quality control stuff. The issue is not the quality of the of the items as far as whether it's good design or any of that sort of thing. The issues are optimizing content so it doesn't play holy havoc with the servers. Yeah. Oh yeah. The end of that. That's yeah. the issue. It's it's that part of it where especially when you get into mesh, there's lots of ways to do mesh that create, you know, where you end up with 60 zillion vertices and, you know, oh, those things, those things, you know, will bring a server to its knees. <laughs> so, so that's their concern is, is being, you know, is, is, is not vetting um, the quality of items, but vetting it of, of having systems in place so that someone can't bring something in that's going to break. Well, yeah. I mean, here's here's the other the thing servers. that I'm sort of curious about with regards to Sansar, because I mean, there's um, like one of the reasons Rockcliffe never got into hosting our own open sim environment. We've been trying to s deliberately stay away from actually doing that. Isn't it isn't necessarily because we don't necessarily want to, you know, perform that particular activity, but as soon as you open up any type of a virtual world environment. Um, you are now responsible for everybody's inventory. You're responsible yes. for their, their avatars, that all their inventory, the sharing of information, all of that content that goes in behind it. And what we're trying to focus on is we're trying to focus on knowledge emergence and education. This is this is our core competency. This is what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. And while we've got a lot of people that are capable of going in and building nice content and building you know all these wonderful little bits and pieces. Um, the challenges of hosting is not really something that really re we want to take on mm. right now. It's going to be mm. interesting to see in a WordPress type environment, right? Or, or similar to that particular type of an architectural structure, um, how the whole concept of inventory and inventory loading, uh, is going to be managed. Um, because I think that's also going to be one of the areas where potentially you know, things can start to get a little bit dicey. I mean, we've already this, got tons of problems right now. Mm. This with, is something we're acutely aware of with the <coughs> with OpenSim, or at least with the hypergrid, because <coughs> you never know, well, you probably do, but hypothetically, you never know whether you're hyper jumping to somebody's home server, a home machine run, running Windows XP and a, a archaic processor who can't get more than one person in there, or whether you're, a, a, you're um, going to a location on a properly managed grid. And yeah. I, I certainly, uh, despite having a look at Sim on the Stick and thinking, oh, it might be nice to have a local intranet virtual world, if you like, <laughs> um, you know, on my desktop, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I've got my hands full um, playing with the regions um, I've now got. But, um, you know, I, I, I can handle actually running an entire grid and the whole back end of, alongside that, even if it was a... Even if it was a non-public grid, or rather a semi-public grid, in other words, it was put up for particular things, and it was online as, say, a TV studio, about nothing particularly else. The uh, just to do that, there are so many additional things to to take care of, getting servers to run smoothly, the communication protocols and things. You really don't want that, you know. You you, you know, the, there is always going to be a niche for those people who are specialized in that uh, con connectivity level and, oh, and host yeah, you. Sure. And um, I was curious when you said that you've been um, angling for the um, community gateway thing, whether you got the impression that that is something they're also looking at in terms of projects, and so whether they want gateways. I, um, I don't, uh, shoot, I don't really know right at the moment because, I mean, if you look at, again, I'm going to go back, I'm, I'm playing on this whole thing in terms of this WordPress model just because mm. they've they've mentioned it in a dozen communications so far. So WordPress right at the moment, you install the basics of WordPress and then you can go out and you can pick up all these plugins and additional materials and some of them will be free mm. of charge because they're open source and other pieces you go to different groups where they might provide a free version and then there's a paid or a professional version and the price points for all of those plugins are all over the place. 
Mm. Um, you know, if we look at the same type of a thing with regards to a virtual world environment, um, then I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's going to be interesting because, I mean, you could have groups that would go out there and, you know, it, let's say this platform takes off. Right? It, it actually does gain traction and it's it's going to be, you know, even half of what it is that they promise. Um, it, it could be quite possible that you'd, you'd have groups that are going out there. And one of the things that they want to are looking to develop are different plugins for exactly those types of things, such as mentoring or education or um, other mm -hmm. things, such that if you want a community gateway, it's just sort of like, okay, well, you know, you know, this group has, has one and we in one play, off you go. Um, but I mean, I I don't know. I'm mean, just it's in in terms of all those community interactions. Mm. That's that's the thing that sort of got me a little bit. I, I'm trying to I, I'm trying to envision different scenarios in in terms of how this might be helpful to the community. I'm I'm mm. partially thinking, depending on how they do it, this could be really beneficial. But at the same time, they could do it in such a way that it really doesn't help anybody that all it is is another product in a mm. space of 30 other products that are all trying to clamor for the same thing so i don't know i, mean, I, I think lot, we know i think we need more information yeah i mean a lot of people who have been uh, seem to have been talking with linden labs recently uh, uh, have come away impressed by the fact that you know the buzz in linden lab is project sansa and you know, sure, Second Life continues as ever, but there's the, their prime focus is on a new platform. Um, you know, they've got a division handling Second Life <laughs> and, they, and such, but um, you know, they do. I, and I could, I could completely see something like Second Life continuing on mm. because this is this is a hosted <clears throat> managed service, and there's always going to be a market space for this particular type of a service. Yeah. Right. And so. I, I actually wonder, I mean, what I was talking about this um, over on the hypergrid a, a bit, um, you know, what, what in a way, and it sounds odd, but, well, uh, you know, one of the good things that could come is that they'll launch a commercial project that will be state of the art, like Project Sansa, whatever its name will be. And it will be successful and it will impact on um, Second Life's usership. And. You know, uh, they say they will keep Second Life going as long as it um, you know, makes money or whatever. But, I mean, it's possible that the um, users of Second Life will, you know, we're already seeing a lot of regions, like uh, the five steampunk regions disappeared this week alone. Um, you know, um, we may see a decline there. But one thing that the Linden Labs could do with Second Life, ye olde Second Life, if you like, is Hypergrid enable it. So it actually um, becomes part of the, the open metaverse and then they can pursue that in parallel with uh, a brand new platform that may work differently. But uh, yeah, I, I was intrigued that you focused on this um, WordPress of virtual worlds thing because I had heard that expression used, but I have to admit in all honesty, I hadn't really picked up on on the um, the, the, the serious idea of that metaphor well there's a there's a very specific uh application architecture that goes along with that particular type of model mm -hmm. and so the interesting thing is i i don't know whether or not they've used the wordpress of virtual worlds just simply because they're trying to pick up on wordpress as a buzzword for for marketing purposes Mm. or whether or not it truly is going to use a model similar to WordPress for the underlying application architecture that it's all going to be based on. And if it's the latter piece, then that's, you know, we we could almost like, I mean, if you wanted to sit down for the next hour with a Visio template, I mean, we could probably map out 90% of what it is that they're going to do over the next six months. I mean, mm. it, it's really... It, it, as soon as they mention that, if that's what they're going to do, it becomes very simple in order to figure out what it is the architecture is going to look like, what the business model is going to look like, and where, where it potentially is going to go from there. But if it's just simply a marketing term that somebody happened to throw out, 
<laughs> right? To say, oh, you know, this is what we're thinking of doing, then, you know, all bets are yeah. off. Right? So. Yeah, I can't imagine them actually doing WordPress, which is open <laughs> source and free. Yeah. Because it's like it's Linden Lab. They don't, <laughs> you know. Don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, I was. Uh, <clears throat> no, I, well, I mean, if they if they use sorry, I mean if they use the Apple model though, because I mean Apple you know, Apple charges the application developers in order to produce apps for, um, for that particular platform, right? right? So there there is a model that's out there that they could leverage upon. And if I'm not mistaken, aren't there a couple of Apple executives on the board of London Labs? Uh, yes, but Apple's uh, ecosystem is the opposite of the WordPress ecosystem. Uh, yeah, no, so no, I realize that. I, no. I, I definitely can see them following the Apple model. Uh, you know, we buy our platform, buy our product, and then we'll let you, you know, third-party developers run apps on it. Uh, like or like like the, the, in fact, I think it's what they're doing right now with inviting the Maya developers mm. in to to create stuff. Mm. And that's what Apple does. And Apple takes a 15% or 30% cut of all the money they make in their Apple store. And uh, the, but the, and the entire platform itself is totally locked down <clears throat> and ni nice and crisp. So, 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 you, so you, could, you, you could think of like Second Life as, the, as Apple and uh, mm -hmm. OpenSim as the Android platform. <laughs> all these uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of intriguing this a bit though because you have exact. I'm thinking of the psychology at Linden Labs, even though they this predates the current CEO. Um, you know, they have had um, a long-standing history, even back to the days of Philip, of taking this wonderful user-created world and literally pilfering the best of it and taking it under their own wing. They, and it often backfires. They take, you know, they buy up three different market well they have a marketplace they buy up two others they merge them all together and all the uh shops in world start complaining because the the finances are running a shop are no longer there people can just easily go to the marketplace and buy it there so the world suffers because you know one thing gets better <laughs> a consolidated marketplace without competition and, worse. Yeah. and uh, another thing gets worse and I can, you know, whereas um, High Fidelity, I can see, right, they will build an infrastructure and, um, you know, Philip and Co. will probably turn around and hold on to some of the essential services in order to recuperate their investment. But they will, uh, they'll, let, they'll actually build something that a large part of it is open source that people can develop uh, and plug into it. I don't ever see Linden Lab quite having that approach. Um, I've, I asked Ebby and Philip, uh, you know, um, about any commonality between what they're working on. And, you know, the message was clearly there is none. Um, you know, um, Linden seemed to be following the path of a continuing walled garden. And I suspect, you know, that, um, you know, maybe they'll have a thing where they'll allow people to develop independent plugins. Then they'll take one look at them and buy them in um, or, um, or charge you for, um, you know, um, a rate for doing the plugins. Maybe, um, maybe you'll be able to <coughs> have a WordPress virtual world, as it were, that you kind of author and plug into the grid. But then, you know, the conditions will be that Linden Labs handles all the inventory on their servers and handles all the permissions on their servers. And really, all you've got is a front end of a website. Not, you're not running the website. You're just designing the front page. Um, and uh, Linda, you know, this isn't a criticism because it's probably in some ways a, well, a good business model. But it seems to me that Linden Labs' approach to these things has always been the uh, 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 the um, uh, 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 <laughs> it says a bit like Apple. It's the the uh, the, the corporate metaverse, and it's uh, for that reason, it's not the metaverse. It's you know, it's a um, however huge it is, everything is on Linden own server farms. And everything is controlled centrally. That gives you some stability and things like that. But um, you, you know, you're um, you're no more free in Second Life really than you are in Facebook. You know, the, you're you're basically, um, you know, um, performing the illusion of freedom in somebody else control in somebody else's corporate control space. And I can't ever see Linden Labs. Um, allowing the avenues, opening the avenues, at least with the new platform, that will um, enable other people 
independent um, uh, parties to actually take advantage of what they're doing. That, I think, is the biggest difference between what Lyndon Labs seem to approach things um, as and how Philip and High Fidelity are approaching it because they're much more open to the idea of collaboration, contributors, and open sourcing as much as they can without, uh, but obviously keeping something else back so they make some money themselves. Um, so, you know, that, that's sort of how I've come to perceive the differences between, you know, these two two things that are, I mean high fidelity is further down the line of course uh, well, well sort of because I mean the interesting thing is that Philip's working on some very interesting technical like some very technical problems yeah um, with regards to especially with regards to latency and that's probably mm -hmm. the largest one that um, you know if he manages to get a really really good firm handle on it and some of the examples that he's shown so far seem to actually be going that particular direction Mm. Um, he he's actually going to have something very strategic to anybody that that sort of incorporates that technology into what it is that they're doing. So I'm not necessarily sure that high fidelity. It's in terms of a virtual world is really where their money is really going to be at. I think it's mm. going to be in the the patent the patenting of the underlying technology and that we will probably see some collaboration between the Sansar project and what Philip's doing. Maybe not as a direct buyout, but certainly as, as uh, you know, leveraging and reuse of technology. I, I cannot picture Philip not um, Trying to set engaging to with, <laughs> with his, his old baby in terms of yeah. uh, making sure that it sort of goes in the direction he envis originally envisioned like 12 13 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, uh, you know, talking of babies, I mean, Philip's baby really is, you know, he's a physicist. I mean, you know, he he basically achieved the la the low latency that um, with video that um, made real networks work back in the day <laughs> before Second Life. And before that, he worked on image compression for fast, you know, delivery. So he's, he's obviously... You know, a very, very cued in <laughs> to the idea of fast delivery, um, i.e. <laughs> no latency <laughs> or no visible latency, shall I say. So you, pr you probably have a very good point there. Um, if, if they can somehow, as you say, patent or trademark certain aspects of that technology um, that other people will need, maybe the actual platform they end up with, the virtual world, will just be an incidental part of the the whole engine, shall we say. So, uh, <laughs> uh, we are in Second Life, so no wonder we're talking about Linda Labs. Um, <coughs> Fe Felon. Um, yes. What else, what else is new as far as Rockcliffe? Um, next year's uh, Virtual World's Best Practices, of course. Um, uh, uh, very, the, the various actual enterprises independent of the platform, shall we right. say. Right. Okay. okay. So, uh, so commercial message. Um, the I'm going to be going down to the uh, nonprofit commons uh, this Friday. I'm going to be one of their speakers um, at their, I think it's, um, they said 1130 Eastern. So that's what, 830 a.m. Pacific time? Second uh, life time. Uh, um, so yes, yes, we asked it. Okay, so I'm going to be down there talking about uh, what we're sort of calling Rockcliffe 2.0. Um, if people were to go onto our website right now, you'd notice that there's a pile of changes that are happening, even sort of as we speak. Um, we're doing a massive revamp. We've had a lot of discussions over the last six months in terms of where Rockcliffe needs to be going, and so the last several months we've been. Uh, working on trying to get some of the um, the content available for that put into place. There's a lot more that we need to do, but um, you know, there's uh, we're we're essentially um, we've we've always had this model that we're here to serve, and that's to provide service, education, and research in virtual environments. And we're doing a lot of restructuring to really move that particular agenda forward in terms of our mission statement. So right now we're we're in the preparation stages of uh, putting some educational programs together, specifically for uh, people interested in teaching in virtual environments uh, in terms of how to use these environments effectively. 
Uh, we're going to be using that uh, those courses once we have those done. We've got four of them that we actually need to prepare. Um, as soon as we've taught our first uh, few instances of those and we have some uh, real numbers and metrics that we can show the um, IACET, which is, uh, oh, I can never remember this acronym, <laughs> the international, it's it's basically an ANSI standards group. They, they provide yeah. an ANSI certification for providing uh, continu uh, continuing education units. Yeah. And in the case of educators, they can take those CEUs and they can, in some states, not all, but in most states, you can actually take those CEUs and you can have them exchanged for continuing education credits for their recertification for for professors and college uh, professors and what have you. Mm. So we're looking at uh, once we have, um, you know, at least uh, two or three of each of these four courses that we're going to be in development over the next couple of months. Uh, as soon as we've got a few of those taught and under our belts, then we're going to uh, the ICET to apply for certification. Um, probably will not happen in time for VWBPE this year, but we're hoping it will be done and in the can for the following year. So this Dang. is sort of where we're we're headed at this point, and we're sort of excited about it because we've been uh, we've been making some uh, very serious progress towards mm. those particular objectives. We've also been expanding out in the number of virtual worlds that we're involved in. So we've got uh, our Minecraft campus set up. We've still got our EVE Online campus. We've got our World of Warcraft uh, campus. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> and you've got, of course, you've now got the four regions in Avacon. Uh, we've got the four regions in Avacon. Oh. Yep. And I've got uh, we've got somebody who's doing some redevelopment work for us in Second Life here. And as soon as he's done that, he's uh, going to be working on our library set up over at Avacon, which is going to be amazing. So, yeah, we have a there's a whole pile of changes that are actively coming now. We're actually getting making a lot of progress, whereas the last couple of years we've sort of been uh, sort of keeping the lights on <laughs> type <laughs> of thing. But it's 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 starting to get there. And we're we're really trying to focus on this idea of portability such that, um, you know, if Second Life is still here three years from now, great. If Second Life is not here three years from now, then that's still great because be we're trying, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to make everything portable so that we can sort of go where the technology is going. Right? Now, so that's, that's the whole uh, impetus in terms of why we haven't really gotten involved with hosting. Because um, yeah. it's, it's, it's really a, when you're dealing with cutting edge technology, you have a, uh, you you have a real opportunity to get burnt by it because oh, <laughs> yeah. you can yeah. you can always end up over investing in something like that and mm -hmm. so what we've always said that we want to do was we want to invest in the the competency that overlays the technology and then to move with the technology as the technology um you know, innovates into different directions. Do would you say uh, that's a final question related actually to what you're saying? I guess already, um, uh, obviously, you're using some academic language there. But um, I mean, Rockcliffe is um, a purely uh, virtual university in the sense you may be um, established on different grids, different games, if you call them that, for the World of yep. Warcraft, I don't know. But you are a virtual entity and um, a core virtual entity is in the world of education and uh, coordinating um, uh, similar things as, as, and of course, virtual best practices in education is exemplary of that too. Um, to what degree um, do you... Um, you know, you you are a focal point there in terms of uh, virtuality, and you're spreading the message too, of course. To what degree do you interact or promote with um, a real world universities who may have? Uh, I'm thinking of actually um, uh, James, our cameraman, um, is um, um, at um, uh, uh, I forget which university it is. Until two weeks ago, we were broadcasting from the university, but um, oh, Wisconsin—that's the University of Wisconsin. No. 
And I, I remember, I, I hope you don't mind me saying this, he made some anecdote in um, Skype chat recently, but uh, I wish I could find somebody else on the staff here who could also do this stuff with me. And I suddenly thought, you know, you're in an educational institution, you're passionate about the, the, the possibilities of the virtual world and everything else, but there's not necessarily um, a lot of people um, on staff with you. Um, yeah, he says, no problem, that's true. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, on staff with you. And I, I wonder to what extent Rockcliffe and maybe any other, um, you know, people really active in the virtual world are so reaching out to um, other institutions that maybe just have one or two people who are interested and trying to facilitate their communication internally, as it were, to um, try and bring uh, more educational uh, institutions and just projects um, uh, um, online virtually. Yeah, it, it, it's been a little bit frustrating, especially the last uh for you know, four or five years, because in 2009, when Linden Lab pulled out the rug from underneath the educational and nonprofit community, mm. um, the community really, over the next two years, sort of broke up. They, um, you know, there was a little bit of denial the first year, and then people got really mad the second year, and then they figured, screw this, we're going to go somewhere else. Um, not everybody, but you know, a large proportion of mm. those people were really um, hurt. And like emotionally hurt by what was going on, it was yeah. it was literally a betrayal. And um, I, you know, at the time we were, um, I, I'm trying to remember if it was 2010 or 2009, but we were almost at the point where we were going to be the first virtual educational organization uh, with Inside Second Life that had no state or other funding that was going to be um, was was aiming towards profitability. Mm. Um, we were within a, uh, the one year we were within a hundred dollars of like breaking even, um, it doesn't include staffing costs, but include all included of all of our technical infrastructure and what have you. And mm. had that trend continued, uh, our next step step would have been to start hiring after full time. Um, when everybody sort of broke up, those opportunities sort of went out the window because nobody mm. wanted to invest in the platform anymore. But I mean, we were working with Duke University. We were working with the University of Texas. We were working with uh, Loyola University of Maryland. Um, University of uh, Idaho has been a very strong proponent of VWBPE the last little while and a lot of the stuff we're mm. doing at Rockcliffe. So there are groups that are out there that are still interested in these particular types of experiences and where the technology and where the um, uh, where the methodologies for teaching with inside these environments are potentially going to. Mm. Um, and there are still projects that are coming up. We're hoping that with the relaunch of the website that we can actually tie more into that. We've been working with the University of Texas um, the last six months, and we've actually been learning a lot in terms of um, what is really important for college and university professors within said, that adult education field, not so much the K through 12, but mm. you know, more the, the adult side of things. So you'll find that on the website now, really there's going to be a huge slant towards that particular direction because we have a very clear value proposition that we can provide for that particular group, which is phenomenal. Um, there's all kinds of things that we've discovered that, especially over the last year, where there's this big gap in terms of people wanting to know more about these, still wanting to know about these particular environments. They still want to do things with social media. They still want to get into this idea of virtualization. But the same problem keeps coming up. Nobody knows where to find the information. And we're sort of like, hello, we're here. We have the information <coughs> for you. We can clearly show you what it is you need to do and where you need to go. And it's, so, uh, it's interesting because uh, 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 Maria has a phrase she's used now and again called the dark metaverse, which uh, <laughs> where we're referring really to um, I, um, Open Simulator. Um, grids, some of which are hypergrid enabled, some of which aren't, but are largely invisible to to you when you go hypergridding around because yep. they don't advertise themselves. They might be behind a firewall, an educational institution, they might be R and D for a company, for all we know, but they're they're, they're all out there, and um, you know, so that that of course is one option. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, the 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 price discount 
um, removal that Lyndon did that time ago. I think it was all the more horrific because this showed absolutely no sensitivity to even little things like the academic year for finance and things like that. They just plowed on in there and said, hey, sorry. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, some people have retreated into what you might well call semi-private um, things yeah. um, on the metaverse. And, um, but like you say, I mean, it's quite possible other, um, you know, other universities, schools, whatever, that were interested um, sort of saw, um, saw what happened with um, the Lindens and just thought, oh, well, you know, um, as you say, they were emotionally effective. And instead well, of finding, instead of diving headlong into an alternative and risking the same problem again, they maybe just sort of um, quietly thought, well, that's not for us anymore. Or something. Well, let me see if I can find it here because, I mean, and maybe uh, Maria remembers what this stands for, but there's a um, there's an I, IED conference uh, coming up in, I think it's next week. IED? Uh, Improvised Explosive Devices? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, I don't think that's the one. <laughs> immersive, IED, immersive education, something. Oh, way. right, right, right. Immersive <laughs> education, yes, in Europe, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So here we go. Immersive, uh, I think it's immersive. Uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, it, yeah, here we, here we go. Immersiveeducation.org, right? So here, yep. here's a group of people in Europe, and they're, they're highly into all of the, the virtualization stuff, right? They're, they're into the virtual reality, the holograms, the robotics. They've got these wonderful little K through 12 programs that are designed to be collaborative between different groups. They can't stand <laughs> Linden Lab because they've been burnt by them, and they're, they're still six, six, seven years later upset by this, yeah. and, and. You know, it's there's there's people that I know who are in exactly the same problem happened mm -hmm. inside Second Life, and they you can see their blood boil every time they even start to think about it. So you know that's that's going to be that. It's how do I want to put this? That's a very hard thing to try to get over, right? Mm -hmm. Not just for the individuals involved that that are you know, not willing to necessarily give certain groups a second chance, no pun intended, but, mm. um, you know, the, the fact that the lab has to now overcome this barrier and the fact that that these people are very vocal about this when you start bringing this up in conversation. So yeah. it's not a question of a market base being out there and being quiet and sort of saying, well, you know, I'll just ignore these people and maybe they'll go away. I mean, there's a real active in some communities, a real active hate on for the lab and what yeah. it is that they've done. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and so, you know, it's, it's frustrating because you see some of these things that the lab is trying to do. They're trying to reach out. They're trying to be, um, they're, they're trying to, I guess, from their point of view, do the right thing. And I, I don't know. I mean, the only thing I can, uh, well, well, and I can't even relate to this one cause I've never been married, but I mean, the only thing that I can, you know, sort of, related to is somebody going through a divorce. Mm. Right? Like, I mean, if you go I, through a really I, ugly breakup, you're never going to talk to that person again, right? So, you know, I have been through a divorce and yeah, I never want to talk to him again. Yep. Yeah. I think you're right. I, you know, when you, when you've been let down that much, uh, you, you, it's really hard to regain the trust again. I think that's what it comes down to. Is is once the trust is gone, it's gone. You're yeah. you're always thinking, mm -hmm. oh, they 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 stabbed me in the back before. Uh, let's. I'm not gonna. I'm 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 gonna back. I'm gonna keep facing them and just back away. Slowly. I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I think. I you know, I'd agree with that. You know, if, um, you know, but I, I'm not not very good at giving people second chances because the first chance reveals an awful loss. You know, and uh, if you feel, you know, if if you feel it, you just think, well. Um, forget them, you know, burn the bridge. But I, you know, th th this it's um, well, I don't know. I mean, it, in in <clears throat> summary, in a way, I'm not sure really. Linda Lab has ever been a particularly good fit for education, anyway, because 
Admittedly, if you want to, um, you know, go to the general public, and let's say Second Life is the general public, because although it's not the web, it is a microcosm of the real world, and there is a population there. So if you want to launch something which is, say, um, a project to enhance education about um, domestic abuse, right, a very specific thing, and you want to reach a large number of people, a ready-made audience, then quite possibly Second Life is the place to go and do that. But if you're actually an educational institution and have a particular agenda of your own, it doesn't really make sense that you are trying to do it within a corporate wall garden. Uh, we all know that universities have ties with industry these days. You know, a lot of research wouldn't get done if there wasn't finance coming in from commercial companies. But um, so that um, tie in between education and industry and uh, R&D is always going to be there. But it's it's adaptable. It's variable. You know, the uh, the people that finance um, research in one university are not, you know, a completely different group are doing it in another university. It's not as though every but you know and you know the, uh, it's not as though um, one company like a hypothetical linden lab is financing all the research in every university so it's not it's not an umbrella of a place really for it, the it, variety of things that um, education involves it, it's it, not but to be to be fair right i mean the, this entire environment the way it's been set up has was never really set up with the intention of people deriving full-time incomes out of this particular environment. This was set up yeah. as a place for people to come and to um, be artistic and to innovate and to um, bring ideas, give expression to ideas. Yeah. And unfortunately, as soon as you start bringing any type of real business to the platform, there's a thousand things in here that are missing. Right. Starting starting off with just something very, very basic, but starting off with the fact that when you go to work for a particular company, right, that the whatever it is that you're working on, right, is typically the asset of that particular company. It's not the asset of yourself individually. Yeah. So, you know, if if you're IBM and you want to bring a whole pile of people into Second Life, right? The very first thing that you want to do is you want to say, okay, where are the controls that I can I can control? What you know, who has what avatar? What the passwords are? And yep. I look at I as IBM look after the inventory, and it's our inventory, not their inventory. Exactly. That's something extremely basic that in the real world would never have ever been an issue. Because everything that we have set up, all of our processes, all our procedures, how we work with government, how we work with industry, our suppliers, everything is based around the fact that that's just – it's part of how we do business. In a virtual world, all of that has to be built, <laughs> and it has to be considered up front, and it was never considered up front. They got two years into this, and all of a sudden – uh, I for uh, Stroker, right, is starting to make you know thousands of dollars in terms of selling <laughs> sex toys, mm. right? And he, you know, and and people are sort of like, oh shit, I can make a killing in here. Um, you know, uh, Ashley Chung is another one, right? Yeah, really, and you know, that's thing. that's yeah. yeah, I mean, that's another one where the where the you know the the whole real estate tools first. First of all, the tools are really not available in order to manage those particular properties effectively. Mm. The the group permissions and other permissions are not set up effectively for managing uh, land, especially for education and other things, effect, you know, effective for this, this particular type of envir environment. And then you overlay that with this idea because I, I, I hopefully you remember this, but you know, Linden Lab a few year, quite a few years back. They had the tier price up. I've forgotten where it was, but they had it up fairly high. And then all of a sudden, they dropped it by almost 50% in terms of full, the cost of full regions. And mm -hmm. all of these land barons, the very first thing they did was they came along and they said, what the hell have you guys done? You've just killed us. All of our yeah. quote-unquote property values have just depreciated. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just laughing my head off because I'm sitting here thinking, you idiots, this is not real estate. This is mm – -hmm information technology this is service, and, service and, based and, on somebody else's <laughs> yeah. well it, it doesn't matter whose yeah. it is but i mean yeah. it's, you, you're 
the the guiding <laughs> the guiding economic principle is not the principle that real estate always increases over any given ten year period of time. Yeah. The guiding principle is Moore's law that says, at, you know, over any eighteen months, either the amount of services you're going to get is going to double or the price is going to decrease by half, right? And that's been consistent since the early nineteen sixties. <laughs> Right. So mm -hmm. why would anybody think that if you bought virtual land with inside any type of a virtual world environment that, you know, four or five years down the road from now, that it's going to be anywhere close to being worth what it is that you paid for it? Mm. And I, well, right. I think what you're what you're up against there is the degree to which people who were um, who were doing things came into doing them, who sort of fell into those niches and they and they. And they and they bought the immersion of well, they, a virtual yeah, environment completely. Mm. completely. Yeah. So here so, it is. They, so, they brought all these yeah. real world ideas in with them, and this is not a real world. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but you, you bring you, when you bring that headset with you, mm -hmm. and you, you know you aren't coming from a tech environment where you understand how technology prices plummet um, mm -hmm. over then, time. Yeah. Then yeah, then 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 you then you have that that whole. You know, when real estate tanked in Second Life, and a lot of people, you know, all of a sudden were, you know, were left holding holding bags of, of real estate that they thought were worth, you know, triple what they paid for them, and they were worth twenty five percent of what they paid for them, yeah. if they could find a buyer. Okay. I mean, and, yeah. in, and in the present market, and in the present situation in in, in Second Life, if you're looking at mainland, um, <laughs> it's generally the, the the general practice anymore appears to be. You know, if if you don't want to continue paying tier, you abandon it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe maybe you know if you if you decide, okay, well, I paid tier for this month, but I'm definitely not going to pay. I don't want to pay it next month. You put the property on the market for whatever you think you might be able to get for it, and if it hasn't sold by the date you need to, you know, pull the plug, you just you know you yeah, abandon you it. Just abandon it. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's. Yeah. it's um... I mean, the Anshu Chung's and indeed Stroker operations, I think, were one of a kind. They'll never happen again because of that very thing. They were just very fortunate people mm -hmm. who made their right place at the right time. At, yeah. at the right time. And, um, you know, that, uh, you see it all the while in the fashionista blogs and things. I mean, um, so, so many things going on in Second Life are emulating what happened before. There's um, a lot more emulation now than there is originality. Um, and you know that, that that is really what happens when the pioneers <laughs> move on, and the um, a more a more general um, public is there because we respond to what we like. I mean, I, I I have to admit I was probably the same um, when experiencing the immersion of Second Life for the first time. I mean, obviously you know there was no uh, hypergrid and other platforms me to, to experience it in a time. Um, you know, you're just carried away by the possibilities of the environment. It's, it's a very complex equivalent to seeing a very good movie. You know, um, you, if you enjoy the movie, you don't think that it's, you, you, you don't, you're not consciously aware whether, whether it's a 20th century Fox or Miramax or whoever the producers were, and you're not consciously aware of whether it's a big budget, well, you usually are actually, a big budget Hollywood or whatever, it's a small budget indie, indie film. You are affected by the, the movie as you see it. And, um, you know, the, it's um, on a consumer level, that's, that's what marketing relies on. They want to uh, addict you, entice you, immerse you. <laughs> but um, all, is, all is not quite what it seems. So. You know, I might note that it's probably time it's to probably, wrap. Now. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, ta okay, Tara and Maria, have you got any questions for Felon while he's here? Um, I mean, I, I was firing away here. On that. <laughs> but uh, you may have individual questions. That... Uh, well, I, I was wondering if Felon knows anything about the, uh, the Open Sim conference coming up. The, the only thing that I know right at the moment is that um, right at the moment, um, at least what I'm sort of hearing through the grapevine is that um, the folks there are very busy in terms of the day-to-day uh, -day stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, right now I'm sort of hoping that they're going to move forward with something on that, but um, I really don't know whether it's a go or no go or or what's going to happen so um 
I've, I, I wish they would decide one way or the other because I would do what, whatever size conference there is. I would do everything I could to get to get to to get it going, at least to have some some stuff up there. So whether it's just a one track conference or uh, one of those uh, instant pop up conferences or something, um, I'm willing to do everything I can to get to get people together. And um, so the sooner we start, the, the, the more we can do. Yeah, I think I get, you know, I'd, um, I'd put time into helping organize something like that if it was needed. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a matter of finding out if anything has happened. I, I got an IM from Joyce uh, Bessengord during the show, actually, but um, really just saying that she can make it and um, not tell me much else. So, um, but yeah, if, the, if um, Avacon um, as such are going to take a year off on it or something and not do it then um, or, or want to just get let other people help yeah just um, make a decision yeah. one way or the other you yeah. know if they don't do it I will do it somebody else will do it we'll step up we'll do it but you know decide <laughs> yeah and you know it's a, it's a very important event it's always been highly attended highly successful and of course it's all about the open metaverse and, of course, um, and the grid's already there. The infrastructure's there. Yeah. Uh, people have been trained. We've got two years' worth of trained people ready to come in and help out. Um, we just, you know. We just need to find the ones that aren't busy and then get together yeah, and well, say to the busy ones, shall we do it on our own or are you going to do it? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's, it's a bit, and again, to be honest, I mean, it's, it's a very, because I will fully admit this, it's a very difficult thing to try to pull a conference together, right? And yes, when, you're, yes. when you're doing it as a group of volunteers where everybody has full-time day jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a far different experience than when you look at groups like ISTE where, you know, this is their full-time job just to put on, com- you know, a, a big conference every year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a huge difference between those particular two, two extremes, so, you know, if it happens, that'd be great. And, you know, you know, we'll be in our, like a dirty shirt and willing to support everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, if it doesn't happen, then, you know, hopefully, you know, we can, you know, help them get things up and running again for next year. So, you know, right. we'll, we'll, we'll see what uh, request for assistance that comes out that they need and, and hopefully they'll get something together. I'd like to have right. something, even if it's super scaled back, you know, um, have something happening this year. I would, I'd really like that. Yeah, well, you, I can don't, tell- you don't have to have the fully fledged conference every year. If you just, no, have, no. So long as you have a sort of mini conference for the years, so you can't do the big one, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, VWBB is still a go. We're about to get the. Um, hopefully, the call for proposal will be ready to go out for the end of the month. Uh, that's what we're shooting for right at the moment. So the um, you probably should see our website for that, which will be in March. Um, that'll be, you know, we'll be starting to advertise on that probably in about three or four weeks. Oh, right. So prior, prior, okay. prior to, prior to October 1st. Great. So we all start planning for that at least. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tara, did you have any, um, anything specific for no, that? Um, no, no, but I'm certainly looking forward to, to hearing, uh, to hearing how it goes as you work on your new, uh, coursework. Yeah, we're we're yeah. sort of looking forward to that. The uh, we we've, we've had the um, I will the understand from from ability. other areas the uh, you know continuing education credit uh, routine is is uh, it's not a slam dunk and there's a lot of paperwork to do to to get the the certification, but it makes all the difference. Um, well, it's it's going to run us about five or six thousand by the time we're done in order in order yeah. to put everything mm-hmm. in and. You know, we over the summer we've been going through what exactly is required, and it's it's going to take us a good um, probably nine months uh, at this point in order to get all the um, the courses together, the classes done, the documentation put together. I mean, there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done, and again, mm-hmm. we're we're all doing it as volunteers as well. So, I mean, it's being done after our regular day jobs type thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if we manage to pull this off, I'm going to be quite happy and. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, 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 it would be it would be really nice because this like uh, next month we're in we're in September right yeah okay so so next month Rockcliffe officially turns nine and then a year October will be our tenth year anniversary so 
my goal really is that before Rockcliffe gets to its 10th year anniversary, that we have this certification in the can. That's my goal right now. Good goal. Good goal. Okay, well, I think it's about time we wrap, as Tara um, uh, hinted, <laughs> as she always does when she's around. Well, since we're, we're <laughs> over two hours, well over two hours. Yes, I know. Yeah, <laughs> Last week, Maria even stood up on the two-hour mark and <laughs> refused to sit down again. <laughs> yes. Right. I uh, wasn't deliberate. <laughs> no, I know, I know it wasn't. <laughs> That's why we noticed it. <laughs> uh, James made some remark about she, <laughs> she's off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay. So that's it, I think. Um, I, I always like to wrap up with just uh, going around everybody here and saying, oh, is there anything else that we haven't discussed so far that um, has been exciting you over the last week or the coming week? I'll start with you, uh, Maria. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to be starting to collect the data. Uh, it won't be coming out uh, this week, but the week after that. So if you have a new grid, please let me know. I can put you on the list, get you in the statistics. Um, I'm uh, posting some reviews of, of uh, Free Fly and of the Lampert game, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and I've ordered a, a Samsung Gear. Did I tell you about this? Oh, next week's toy, eh? Yes, it was. It was I got it for half off for a hundred bucks instead of two hundred. Okay. It, it was. It was a, it was a special <laughs> deal. I'm so excited. Um, and. Uh, so I'm going to be doing comparing it to all the Google cardboards I've got, and uh, I'm 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 going to be so happy. Another so, show, another show, another gadget with Metaria. Yes, <laughs> I yes, love that. Yes, We've yes. got to have a new byline for you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so um, yeah, if anybody wants to see me, see me in real life on video, let me know. Uh, uh, I wonder if there's like a even even demand for that. More of me. <laughs> yeah, well, I, uh, we were. Uh, 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 I mean, you know, I thought I, I thought uh, me on video was enough to break the uh, glass on the CRT <laughs> tube, actually. But um, uh, uh, Tom and I, uh, you know, we're not the most uh, photogenic of people on camera, but um, people, you know, used to tune in when we did Metaverse Week in Review as a webcam show. So um, I think I, I think a lot of people just logged in because they wanted to gawk at the real person behind the avatar. You know. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've been looking at YouTube videos, and it seems like it's not so much the fact whether somebody's photogenic or not that that makes people successful as oh yeah as their personality and whether they connect with the audience or not. Oh yeah, I agree. I agree absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was I was being I was joking when I said that, but, <laughs> but you know, yeah, I think that you know, I I think that is another side of it, and particularly with virtual worlds, you know, people are get very used to seeing my face or, as an avatar. And they know my voice, but they, um, unless they're old timers who watched our old version of our show on the web, um, they're not familiar with me, the um, RL face. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, Felon, Felon, anything that's excited other than we, what we discussed that's excited you in the last week or the week coming up, or, you know, just the past, present, and future sort of thing, you know? <laughs> no, I, I did. No, I think in, in terms of a lot of stuff going on with Rockcliffe, I mean, I just wanted to drop that little nugget in terms of what it is that we're doing. Uh, the VWBB conference is. A go for March, and we're going to start doing our calls out at the end of this uh, end of this month. We're going to pull the committee together at the end of this month, so um, you know we're well on on track with that. Um, you know, there'll be more stuff coming out probably in a couple of months, uh, but for right now, I mean, we're sort of excited about where where things are and where things are going, and you know, it's it's nice to see progress for a change. So, mm. you know, I th I think we've got a um, I think we've got a good handle on things, and I'm really hoping that this is going to sort of pan out for everybody. Great. Well, good luck as always. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. And Tara, anything else? Uh, well, um, I'm I'm hoping that uh, I sort of actually expecting sometime here in the next few weeks to get back to paying uh, paying attention and and. Uh, for, for proceeding with my learning on, um, on uh, mesh. Blender uh, and Mesh, uh, having been uh, duly distracted the last while by a combination of uh, this being gardening season and uh, in the last couple of weeks, a couple of new kittens uh, in my environment. Yes, two new kittens. 
but they're not the ones barking behind the scenes at the back. No, 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 no. The, the barking isn't from me. <laughs> no, I think it was. Or oh, 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 it was, what's his name across the road? But I did that today. <laughs> anyway, that's it for me. Okay. And uh, that's it for me, too. I, I have still got my um, Second Life Twitter feed open, but uh, we're out of time. We're out of time. So um, do check uh, twitter.com slash Malburns underscore writer or Malburn space writer will probably do it too uh, where you can find links to media um, via my Tumblr blog and also various Twitters uh, for destinations and things in Second Life and of course follow me twitter.com slash Malburn it's my main feed for um, general news about the metaverse and um, uh, interfacing and stuff like that so um, just a final round I'd like to thank everybody we've got in the studio today um, first of all thank you uh, especially for coming at the last minute to uh, Felon Carmel. Thank you, Felon. Thank you very much. And we'll see you soon, I hope. I always say that if I can't make it for one week, they should just ring you up and get you to replace me. You're as good a host as <laughs> anybody, I suspect. <laughs> and um, thank you, of course, to Maria Korolov from Hypergroup Business. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Mel, for having me. Always a pleasure. And I suspect I should say thank you to um, uh, uh, K9. Is that from you? The, my dogs? Yes. <laughs> my dogs. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying hello to the canines while we're at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. And, of course, you can follow uh, Maria at uh, twitter.com uh, slash um, hypergrid business or, indeed, twitter.com slash meta Maria. We're good at promoting Twitter here, aren't we? And, um, and of course, thank you. Um, I, 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 what's there as ever, but she almost feels like a guest today. Um, but uh, certainly a regular with our second live show. <laughs> thank you to Tara. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'm going to wish you all a very good morning. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? Or a very good afternoon, or a very good evening, or indeed a very good tomorrow, depending on wherever and whenever, indeed, you are. And we will <laughs> see you next week. Bye for now.